This phylum is platyhelminthes, and these are flatworms. To give you a sense of where we're going, the examples include planaria, flukes, and tapeworm. These are all forms of flatworms. There are five characteristics that all flatworms have in common. The first one is that we have three germ layers. The endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm are all present. They're tripoblastic um, organisms. They all have bilateral symmetry, and this is a big step in the right direction from cnidarians, which did not have bilateral symmetry. They had radial symmetry, so you'll see that the anterior and posterior ends are different. You'll also see the dorsal and ventral surfaces are different. Um, and they have cephalization, so there is a head with um, some nerve tissue, which we'll talk about shortly. They also have reproductive, muscular, and excretory organs. This is, again, the product of having all three germ layers. And finally, as I mentioned before, they're tripoblastic, so um, they're asolomates, which means that their organs are in contact with a loosely organized tissue surrounding them. Um, and if you don't remember much about tripoblastic and what that means, go back to our original unit, the Introduction to Zoology, and look at the taxonomy notes. The way that flatworms eat is, first of all, they eat small animals and decaying material. Um, they have a mouth on the ventral surface, and it's attached to a muscular pharynx. And that pharynx can push the mouth out and basically act as a tube that will extend the mouth um, where it's inserted into the prey and it will secrete enzymes which will partially digest the food and then suck the food in through the mouth and then down the pharynx. Once it goes down the pharynx, it'll then travel to the gastrovascular cavity. The undigested food and the waste is eliminated out of the mouth through the pharynx. There's a couple of things on this diagram I wanna point out to you. The first thing is this hole here is where the mouth will originate and then the pharynx will extend out, but the mouth is at the end of the pharynx. Um, so the pharynx will come out when it's eating its prey, then that will retract back into the flatworm, the planaria um, in this instance. And um, when, it, when the flatworm's not digesting or not eating. Okay, since um, flatworms are still fairly simple organisms, their respiration, circulation, and excretion can all be covered pretty quickly. Um, they have very thin bodies, they're flat. This allows for material to diffuse. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, that respiration piece, it can diffuse. Oxygen diffuses in, carbon dioxide waste diffuses out. Metabolic waste, if it's small enough, will diffuse out. Um, if it's not small enough, it will leave through the mouth. There are also flame cells. These are specialized cells found in flatworms that remove extra water from them. And then you'll see in this diagram over here, you have this flame cell and attached to it, um, there's a couple of different, so we have flame cells all in here and attached to um, several of them attached together, they'll have an excretory pore and that pore leads out of the flatworm and so the water leaves through that pore. When we talk about response, we're talking about the nervous system. Here we have um, flatworms that possess ganglia, and ganglia is plural, which means they have more than one. Um, these ganglia allow for them to have essentially a primitive brain. It's a primitive nervous system. It allows, uh, it's a group of nervous cells that control the body. Uh, in addition to the ganglia, they have um, nerve cords that run down the side of the body. So you can see there's a nerve cord here, and then there's another one over here. And then you can see there's nerve cords that run between them periodically along the length of the body to coordinate their movement and functionality. They also have eye stalks. You can see that here. They look like little eyes. You can also see that here. They're not eyes in the sense that you and I have eyes, but they are um, a group of neurological cells or nervous tissue that respond to light, and they only respond to light. Not all flatworms move. 
but the ones that do will use cilia. And remember, cilia are like little hairs on the outside that help them, that will beat together and help them glide through the water. Um, they also have two layers of muscles that when they twist and turn, it allows them to move through the water. Um, when it comes to sexual reproduction of flatworms, um, most flatworms that reproduce sexually are hermaphroditic, which means some of them will produce sperm and some of them will produce eggs, and um, they all have the capability of doing both, but they're not going to self-fertilize. Um, then more commonly, and what we're going to observe in lab, is asexual reproduction. And this is uh, a form of asexual reproduction called fission, and this is where flatworms can split into two and they regenerate. So one of the things we're going to do in the lab is we are going to cut a flatworm. So what they're showing you here is if we were to cut the flatworm, this flatworm here, here and here, so that we have three pieces, this piece here, that head, would then grow into a whole new flatworm. And this tail, for lack of a better term, is being shown again here and would grow into another worm. And this middle section here would then grow into a third worm. So that's how they reproduce asexually. And we're going to take a look at that in the lab this week. There are three classes of flatworms that we're going to talk about. The first one is Tuberellia. These are your free living flatworms. Um, they all live in water. It's either going to be fresh water or salt water. And the most common example is planarian. This diagram here does a really good job of showing you what a planarian looks like. So up here we've got the eye spot. Um, they're calling this area here the brain. These are all little ganglia up here, all these little outreaches. And then you'll see it extends down into this nerve cord on both sides. And then what you can't see, because it's underneath what, we're, what we'll get to in a second, it's underneath the digestive system, is that it is still connected. The two sides of the nerve cords are still connected. Um, what you can also see here is the mouth um, with the pharynx attached. And notice that mouth leads into intestines, or what's, it's not really intestines, even though that's what this says it is. It's really the gastrovascular cavity. Instead of showing you a diagram, this is what it would look like under the microscope. Um, you can see from this microscopic image, the eye spots are very visible. You can see the digestive cells um, in that gastrovascular cavity lining it and pharynx. Um, this particular slide is diglusa, and so this is a freshwater flatworm. The other classes that we're going to look at of flatworms are all parasitic. And parasites often show a high degree of specialization, and they often reproduce at much faster rates um, in order to survive. Some of the adaptations that we see in parasitic worms include suckers and or hooks um, that allow them to attach to a host. Um, most of them have a tough tegument, which is um, their outer layer, like we'll see in tapeworms, or they have a cuticle, again, that tough outer layer um, in flukes. And this allows them to prevent the host from digesting them. Um, they often have an absent or reduced digestive, circulatory, and muscular system because they don't need to spend energy on these things. Um, because once they find their host, they're just going to set up shop right there. Uh, as you can see, these little guys here, all around, these little hairs, those um, allow for the hooks to attach, and then they can suck right on in through the mouth. Other adaptations of parasitic flatworms include the fact that they need to reproduce in high numbers to allow for their species to survive. They will produce tens to thousands of eggs, and that will help ensure that a few of them make it to adulthood and therefore perpetuate the species. They have complex life cycles that typically involve more than one host, which can make prevention so much more difficult. For instance, a primary host would be the host where the parasite reproduces sexually, and then there'll be an intermediate host where the parasite will reproduce asexually. 
and then um, I'll show you a diagram that will explain this a little better. The first class of parasitic worms we're going to talk about is Trematoda. These are your flukes. Oftentimes you'll see them called liver flukes as well. They often live in the mouth, the liver, the blood, the skin, or even the gills of some of their hosts. Um, they have an outer body that lacks cilia um, because they don't need to move much. They're just going to suck off their, their host because they're parasites. They often possess two suckers. And as you can see in the diagram here, there's two. Here's the oral sucker. Um, that oral sucker, sucker will attach to the organs in the host and the ventral sucker will attach to some of the tissues within the host. All right, so we're gonna walk through this diagram and we're gonna start at stage one and move all the way around. Well, stage one is here. These are um, eggs that are already fertilized and they pass through the feces. And then stage two, you can see what's happening is this, uh, through this progression, the fluke is becoming more and more developed. And eventually, um, the snail will eat the worm. And then that snail will also pass it. And, and then you have a free swimming embryo here and that free swimming one will then infect a fish and then that fish will get eaten by a human and then at that point we go into the human where the fertilized eggs are passed through the waste the feces and end up back in the water um, we don't see this very often here in the united states because we treat our water and we also don't um, drink the same water that we defecate in, um, but some countries are still developing and that's still the problem. Notice that there's um, a difference between the infective stage and the diagnostic stage. So this particular version of the flatworm, um, we're not going to see in humans because we're going to see that more in the aquatic organisms. Then when we eat them, they have gone through these different stages and as a result of those different stages, it becomes more infective. And that's how we, um, how that fluke will transition from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction. So to kind of show you a little bit more about that, um, there, this is a species of uh, fluke or trematoda that can infect multiple different hosts. For instance, a human host, as you can see with this guy here. Um, in humans, what happens is he gets into the liver. And the liver, because it's infected, will start to produce um, ascetes, which is basically fluid. And that fluid will build up, making this guy look kind of pregnant, because this is just liver fluid from the presence of that, that worm. Um, and then when he defecates, he will pass the fertilized eggs back into the water. Um, as you can see here, so it goes back into the water, the snail gets it goes back into fish and then we somehow eat the fish and then we put it back in our feces. Um, there is treatment, don't worry, but this often only occurs in tropical areas where there's poor sanitation or poor sewage. This is rarely seen in the United States unless someone brought it back with them from another country. The last class of flatworms that we're going to talk about is cestoda. These are tapeworms. These guys live in intestine, um, and they have some very defining characteristics. They have a head that has hooks and suckers, and that's called the scolex. They also have um, the vast majority of the worm is going to be made up of proglottids, and these are just reproductive sections that allow to, them to mass produce new offspring. So here's some diagrams and microscopic images of a scolex. So you can see the hooks here that allows the tapeworm to attach to the wall of the intestine and then suckers. As the fluid goes by, it's going to be enjoying a lot of what's going by and it's going to eat those nutrients and take it for its own. And so those there are suckers. And here in this microscopic image, you can see this is from a very expensive, fancy microscope, um, all these hooks that allows it to attach. The other unique characteristic of tapeworms is that they have proglottid. So what these are, are basically reproductive sections. 
Each mature proglottid is a hermaphrodite. It contains both male and female reproductive organs. Uh, and so within the proglottid, um, the testes produce sperm and the ovaries produce eggs and they can produce fertilized zygotes. Those zygotes can then be passed through your feces and instead of seeing a big worm, all you're gonna see is this little guy come out in your poop or this little guy, because this is the end. So as they get bigger and mature, these will break off and that'll be what is passed through your feces and then passed on to an or another organism. So this diagram here is just showing you that a proglottid has both the male and female reproductive system. Um, basically, you've got plenty of testes and a uterus and um, the fertilized egg will be housed in the uterus until it's ready to become its own little tapeworm. So the life cycle of a tapeworm is very similar to the life cycle of a fluke. So we're going to start down here. We have the diagnostic stage of the um, of the tapeworm. This would be the part where if you were sick, you would poop into some sort of vesicle and a doctor would analyze it and find the proglottids and diagnose you and treat you. Um, but if this doesn't happen into a sanitized toilet and this happens out in nature, then you've got grass, the poop would be in, and that's what cows and pigs are going to feed off of. And so you've got these little tapeworm proglottids, and what will happen is the cow or the pig up here will be eating the grass and either accidentally ingest the proglottid or sometimes it'll go up their nasal passage but your nasal passage just leads right back to your throat and it'll end up in their stomach and then it'll move to their intestine and at which point it'll attach to the, the wall of the intestine. Um, and then we eat the cow or we eat the pork, you know, bacon and hamburgers. Those are all so tasty, so we eat them. Typically, um, it's in undercooked because if you, if you cook your meat long enough, <laughs> It should kill anything that was living in the proglottid. And then, so we consume it. It comes down into our stomach and then it attaches somewhere in our small intestine. And then uh, the proglottids, as they mature, will then pass through our large intestine and out through our waist. And the cycle will then continue. I do want to point out that here, what we're seeing, these two different species here and here, these are different species of tapeworm. One is more likely to infect cattle, you can see that here, and the other is more likely to infect pigs. 